We are so happy you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. If this message touches you in any way, let us know about it. You can email pray at jesustherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. If you would like to know how our ministries are touching the lives of others, you can go to jesustherock.org. While you're there, consider fueling our passion to reach the lost and the unsaved by giving to us. You can click on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen of our website. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to Church on the Rock. Timothy chapter 3, if you have a Bible and you want to read with us, if not, follow along on the screen. Here's some things that I think are so important. Beginning with verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you should know this. I can't keep silent on this any longer. To be silent would be doing you a disgrace. You should know this, Timothy. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and they'll be proud. Scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They'll be unloving and and unforgiving. They'll be, okay, I said that. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and they'll hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious but they'll reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Throw me the King James Version up of verse number five. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, what? Turn away. Leave. Don't stick around. If When they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, from such, turn away. Get out. I mean, saturate that place with your absence. That verse we've all heard quoted and misquoted and read and misread and interpreted and certainly misinterpreted. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, it usually refers to people who just attend a church or a synagogue or some other place of worship, but they deny the power of Jesus Christ to, let's say, heal the sick or to bring financial blessings or they work miracles. They say, well, you know, God doesn't do that anymore, and, and, and so we just go to church and do this, and I get that, and I don't totally disagree with that. I, I get that. That's having a form of godliness and denying the power of God, though. But what I do believe is that we often miss the greater point of this teaching. What is the greatest power that Jesus ever demonstrated upon mankind? To heal the sick, open blind eyes, raise the dead, that was pretty huge. But, but the greatest power that Jesus ever demonstrated to mankind was for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I came into the world so that the world through me might be saved. That's power. That's power. The greatest power Jesus had, has, or ever will have is the power to save mankind from our lost, broken, empty lives and replace it with everlasting life. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. And here's where I have problems with so many pastors, preachers, evangelists, religious leaders, religious followers, religion in general, is that people who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of Jesus Christ to save sinners. They deny that Jesus has the power to save the lost. And he said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. 
That's why I'm here. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. All people. He said, I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick. I came for the broken. I came for the lost. And now I still hear religion stand up and have the audacity to proclaim that this person can't go to heaven. That person will never. Homosexuals can't go to heaven. Alcoholics can't go to heaven. Suicide victims can't go to heaven. Uh, that one really is, you know, that, that on and on and on. They have their list of people whom they deem worthy to go to heaven and their list of people who they deem unworthy to go to heaven. And I can tell you, it, it makes me sick, and I can only imagine what it does to the heart of God. Listen to me. My God has the power to save homosexuals and heterosexuals, alcoholics and adulterers, sex addicts, drug addicts, food addicts. My God can even save church addicts. He can even save religious folks, and they may be the hardest. We, 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 don't, we don't need more forms of godliness. We just need to acknowledge the power of Jesus Christ to save the lost. In Luke's gospel, real quickly, Jesus gives us three examples of lost things. First, he talks about lost sheep and how that he'll leave 99 sheep that's in the fold to go out and find one lost sheep. And then he talks about a widow woman who has lost a coin. And he talks about how she'll sweep the house and mop the house and turn the house upside down looking for one lost coin. And then he goes on right after that and talks, of course, about the lost son and how this son is lost and leaves home and how he comes home and the father runs to him and falls on his neck and kisses him and says, this my son was lost, but now he's found. Jesus places great value on lost things, on lost people. I've shared this with you in the past many times, but this is called a Bic pen. I'm sure you've owned them, but I've never lost a Bic pen. I've had hundreds of them just go away. I don't know where they went. I put them down, I look, and it's not there. It may be in the trash. Somebody picked it up and took it. It's, but you know what? I don't stress over it. I reach in the drawer and I pick up another one because you buy a whole box for like $2 and it's a big pen. It, it, it's just, it is what it is. But once I graduated from high school many, 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 many years ago and one of my first Sunday school teachers here gave me a cross pen with my name engraved on it, a gold pen, and it was, I was so proud of it. I kept it on my desk in a little box, and, and I never hardly used it, but I was just so proud. It meant because I had graduated, and this person had given me this, and it was just really special. One day, I lost the pen. And when the pen was lost, suddenly stop the office, stop the printers, stop what you're doing, find the pen. Because it was lost. In order for something to be lost, it has to have value. Things that are not valuable are not lost. They just go away. They're just not. When Jesus speaks of people being lost, he says they're lost because they have supreme value to me. I care about them. I'll leave 99 behind and go find that one loss. I'll turn the house upside down to reach that one lost coin. And when that one son has left, but he comes home, I'll run to meet him. I'll kill the fatted calf. We'll throw a party. I'll give him a robe and shoes and rings on his face. This, my son, was lost, but now he's found. Jesus loves lost people. You know that there are many people today, and I mean church people, who would be appalled to learn that there are homosexuals in heaven, that there are prostitutes in heaven. If, if they get to heaven and find out that there are prostitutes in heaven, they would just lose it. Some would be shocked to learn that there are Catholics in heaven. Are you kidding me? There are or, or Mormons in heaven, that they're Baptists in heaven. And here's the thing, they will not only be shocked, they would be disappointed. 
Some would not just be shocked and disappointed. Some would be angry. Some would be angry to learn because we all have our ideas of who gets to go to heaven and who doesn't. Here's what I suspect. I suspect those that would be angry to discover that anybody is in heaven, that social outcasts are in heaven, are in reality further than heaven than the people they speak of. That's my theory. Jesus spoke of a prostitute one time who came and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, and he said her story should be told every time the gospel's preached. He never said that about Matthew, David, Moses, Mark, Luke, or John. He said it about a prostitute. Let me give you one more little deal I read the other day, and I thought this was really good. It says, I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door. Not by the beauty of it all, not the lights or its decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp. The thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash. They stood, there stood the kid from the seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Herb, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus, what's the deal? I'd love to hear your take, how all these sinners got up here. God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Give me a clue. Hush, child, he said. They're all in shock. No one thought they'd be seeing you. You realize when God loves broken people, God loves misfits, God loves the outcasts, the Bible tells us that heaven rejoices over one sinner who comes to him more than 99 just people who need no repentance. One of the biggest problems in all this is is our perception, our limited, finite, minuscule perception that we think we're all-knowing and all-wise, and and we set ourselves up as the keepers to the door of heaven, and we have the audacity to declare who's worthy to enter heaven and who's not, and you realize when you do that, you're not just elevating yourself to the status of God, but you're exalting yourself above God because you have the audacity to declare someone unworthy of heaven who God has declared they are worthy. Jesus said, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. For as the heavens are far above the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts far. Don't dare tell me who I can save and who I can't. You have a form of godliness, but you are denying the power thereof. I have the power to save who I will. I have the power to save who I want. We call good, good, and bad, bad, but we only see it from our point of view, which is so skewed. Think about it. Our point of view is skewed by how we were raised, what kind of church we were raised in, what we were exposed to, what we were kept from. Are we really in a position to judge anyone? Peter. Peter had a vision one time because Peter was a Jew, And and Jews were under the law. They weren't anymore because Paul wrote to the Galatian church and he says, Jesus has set you free from the law. But Peter was still tied up in this stuff. He was still in religion. And there were, among other things, among many, many, many other things, there were laws that defined what you could eat and what you couldn't eat. And Jews couldn't eat anything that was considered unclean, which included many animals, different kinds of, you know, they couldn't eat any pork because that come from a pig, which is unclean and so they so G, Peter is one day he's up on the rooftop this house that's kind of where they hung out and relaxed and he's just chilling on the rooftop and he has a vision and a sheet comes down from heaven and on that sheet are all of these unclean animals all, all of, and and God speaks to Peter he says I want you to go and kill these things and I want you to eat them Peter said, no, no, I'm a Jew, and Jews were forbidden by the law to eat unclean meat. You know what God told him? Don't you dare 
call what I've cleaned unclean. Now get out there and get some bacon and ham and pork chops. I'm going to show you what good eating is. Don't you dare call what I've cleaned unclean. Maybe that's why Jesus said over and over and over and over and over again, judge not that you be not judged. You're judging people on things you have no idea about. You're still looking at at under the law and under this religion and what that religion says, and you're in no position to judge anyone. Furthermore, it's not your place and it's not your job. So what must I do to be saved? Well, one thing we know, not judge others. Not judge others. Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, people will be cruel. They'll betray their friends. They'll judge other people. Number two is we know that we have to forgive other people. But here, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, they'll be unloving and unforgiving. These people that I'm telling you to stay away from. Because they're going to be unloving and they're going to be unforgiving. And they're going to preach it from the pulpits. I know I have to humble myself because Paul wrote to Timothy, he says they're going to be reckless and they're going to be puffed up with pride. From such, turn away. Stay away. Run. Get out. When people are judging other people, they're unforgiving to other people and they're so proud that they think they're better than other people. This whole series started one day with with a little raffle ticket I got somewhere. It was I don't I don't even remember where it was from. It was like a dollar, two dollars or something like that. And I gave them something, I threw it in the car. And one day I was driving over at work mobile and I'm going down these old country roads and I saw it there and I picked it up and I don't I don't even remember what the prize was. But I looked at it and for the first time I saw printed on the front must be present to win. And I thought, well there goes that dollar or two dollars or whatever. I'm not going to be over it. I don't know, some car lot or wherever it is on Saturday and doing this. So must be present to win. So I, I just chunked that. And then I had a thought that was a God thought. I thought, must be present to win. And suddenly I thought about that Old Testament scripture where Elijah asked Elijah, before I go, what can I do for you? And Elijah said, I want a double portion of your anointing. I want a double portion of what you got. And Elijah said, you've asked for a hard thing because Elijah was an anointed guy. But he said, I'll tell you what, if you see me when I'm gone, you can have it. In other words, if you're still here, if you stick with me, if you're still here and you see me when I'm gone, you can have it. And he did, and he got it. Must be present to win. You, you got to show up. I thought about the words of Jesus. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. But you you must be present to win. You have to show up. I thought about the children trying to get to Jesus and the people saying, no, 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 leave him alone. Jesus said, stop it. Don't stop them from coming to me. In fact, if you don't come to me like them, you're not even going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be present to win. You've got you've to show up. Jesus said, it's not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Come. I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. I came into the world so that through me, the world might be saved. I came so you could come. The Son of God became a man so that men could become the sons of God. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not those who keep all the rules. Why? Because none of us keep all the rules. Not those who are righteous because he said none of you are righteous. He said all your righteousness is as filthy rags. None of us are worthy of heaven, church. You got to get that in your heart and mind, get that settled. None of us are worthy of heaven. None of us have earned our place in heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I still need to know what must I do to be saved. I've got, I got to know. Well, I got to show up. Honestly, I've got to be.
be there. I've got to stick in the game. I can't quit. I must be present to win. I know I have to humble myself because the Bible tells me that God hates a proud look. It's one of the seven things listed that God hates. I know that I'm not to judge others. That's made very clear. I'm not in a position to judge anybody. And when I do, that God hates that. I'm positive that I have to forgive other people if I ever hope to be forgiven of my sins. He made that very clear. He says, if you don't forgive others their sins, then my Father, which is in heaven, will not forgive your sins in this life or the life to come. Now hold on to forgiveness against somebody. If you're ready to stand before God with unforgiveness in your heart, when Jesus said, if you do it, my Father will not forgive you in this life or the life to come. Tell me who hurt your feelings so bad you're going to die and go to hell over it. So I know that, but I still, because my mind is so finite, wrap this into one thing. Give me one thing. What must I do to be saved? And here's the little repeat. If you've been a part of this church for very long, you've heard this many, many times. The church leaders ask the very same question. What is the single most important thing? What is the most important commandment? Just give me the rule. What must I do to be saved? Break it down. And Jesus said this. He said, the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. Ah, wow. They love that. Remember we said this last week. I wasn't supposed to, but I did. They love that. Love God with all my heart, mind, and soul. I love that. You know why? Because nobody can see my heart, mind, and soul. I got this. I got this. It comes along later on and and it says, whosoever, you know, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. I got that. Why? Because nobody can see my heart. They love this. We love this because nobody can see that. And that's what prompted Jesus to say, "But, but, but wait, wait, wait. The first commandment, greatest commandment, is love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. But the second, which is not really the second, it's just part two of the first, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And and I can't give you the first without giving you the second. Why? Because the second one will determine if you really keep the first one. You don't love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. You love God with all your heart, mind, and soul by loving your neighbor as yourself. That's how every, he said, the whole world will know you're my disciples by this, by your love for one another. That's how you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Now, the the religious leaders Stinking church people make me so sick. When he says this, they said, well, yeah, but who is our neighbor? Really? Who, who am I supposed to love like myself? Let me tell you who your neighbor is, church, that we're commanded by God with his greatest commandment to love. Our neighbor is our black neighbor, our white neighbor, our gay neighbor, our straight neighbor, our neighbor that I agree with and neighbor that I don't, the neighbor I, I, I just love everything about them and the neighbor that I can't stand their lifestyle or what they do, the neighbor that I agree with, the neighbor that I don't agree with, the neighbor that's got you know, piercings and tattoos from head to toe and the neighbor that is wearing the suit and tie and never has anything... I don't care what you think about them. Jesus thought so much about them that he gave his life to save them, and he has the power to save who he will. And when you have a form of godliness but deny that power, he said, run. When someone tries to tell you that this one can't be saved and they're not saved and they're not going to be in heaven and they're not, shut up and run from them. Stay away from them because they're denying the very power of God. See, he didn't die a little bit for some people and a lot for others. He came into the world to save sinners so that sinners through him might be saved. 
He has the power to save sinners. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. He felt so strongly about this that he made that amazing statement to his disciples that will answer our question today, what must I do? Just the last thing he said to his disciples before he goes to be crucified is one commandment, a new commandment I'm giving to you. A new commandment, okay? Here it is. I want you to love others. Okay. Wow, okay, good, good, good. Again, we love that. That's easy. Because nobody can really see who I love. I can fake it till you make it. I can, you know, it's not a, no, 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 no. I want you to love others the same way I've loved you. Ooh, you loved me when I was unlovable. You loved me. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said on these commandments, you can hang all the law, all the prophets, all the denominations, all your rules, all your regulations, all your ideas of who can be saved and who can't. You can hang it all on this, these commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul by loving other people the way I've loved you. Jesus went so far as to say, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me, good and bad. Now just think, in the last minute here, think of the repercussions of this. Think of the repercussions of this. Think of the liberation and the freedom that we have here, where the Spirit of the Lord is. He said, there's liberty. There's liberty. Suddenly, I don't have to judge anybody anymore. Never once did he tell me to judge someone for their sins. I don't have to do that. I'm free to love everybody. Democrats and Republicans. Homosexuals, heterosexuals, prostitutes and preachers. Drug addicts and pork chop addicts. I can love everybody. I can even love church people who are the hardest to love. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, by your love one for another. If you've never gotten one thing out of any message I've ever preached, I pray to God you get this because, listen to me, your very eternity rests on this. Not whether you've slept with your neighbor's wife or you've stole or you've lied or we can go down the list of the Big Ten and then you can go on over to the other 630-something laws in the Old Testament and you can talk about and I can promise you, you haven't kept them. So if that's what you're basing your way into heaven on, you're headed for some sad, sad news. Jesus said one time, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Churches are full this morning, all over this country, all over this world, of people who think they're going to go to heaven because of their goodness. But Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And few there be that find it. What is the straight and the narrow way? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul by loving your neighbor as yourself. Love other people the same way I loved you. I have the power to save anyone. And I love lost people. And the church has come to despise lost people. We say we're here to save the lost. And when the lost walk in and they don't look like us and talk like us and vote like us and us, we're not really interested. We just assume they go on back wherever they come from. Bow your heads. 
Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. I pray that this message touched you in a way that only God can get the glory from. If you would like more information on our church and our ministries, you can go to JesusTheRock.org. While you're there, consider giving us a financial donation by clicking on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us and have a very blessed day.